program that will um, make your coffee go a good long way. Um, Shaul Waldron is an archivist and a curator, and he has um, held the position of archivist at Condé Nast Publications um, since 2003. And in that capacity, he holds the door to what is an extraordinary treasure trove for the likes of people like me um, to come in and really see this um, amazing collection of um, photographs made for the pages of magazines um, before they actually get into magazines. Um, it's full of photographs and tear sheets and notes and uh, copy prints, um, and it is ripe for study. It is also ripe for the use of Condé Nast when they want to bring a photograph forward um, from the past into the future, as they did recently um, for Vogue magazine when an Irving Penn nude was brought forward for um, another um, try uh, at a beauty um, editorial. But Sean uh, has... Um, been trained to look at pictures in their context. And in that regard, I think he's going to give us an interesting look at Condé Nast publications this afternoon. Thank you, Mary. Full disclosure, I had to go in the men's room too, so we were definitely taking that break. <laughs> Okay, here's our, here's our new home. Um, that you can kind of see me waving in the window there if you look close. <laughs> but, so, Condé Nast, um, we moved into the World Trade Center. Uh, we're the anchor tenant in the World Trade Center for about a year now. Um, so I thought this is, we're all really happy and, and thrilled to be in the building, so I just wanted to get that quick plug. But for those of you who don't know what Condé Nast is, these are our brands. Goes back, um, started in 1909, which I'll get to in a second. Um, if you're interested in about the history of Condé Nast and the company, I'll also give them a little plug for down on the bottom, see where it says Heritage? That's a link. You can go on that, and that is the little site that the archive put together. It has an interactive timeline, talks about all the launches, the editors, some of the big uh, cultural moments, who the photographers were, all that. So it's, you can kind of click through and get a history of the company. This is the archive. Um, it's pretty organized. Uh, it's 1.25 million photographs, not that I've counted. Uh, it's about 7,000 linear feet. That's the way you measure an archive by the actual shelf. So that's more than a mile of shelves. And uh, we've got about 25,000 magazines. And then there's corporate ephemera, letters. Um, you name it, there's illustrations as well, which are some of my favorite things in the archive, um, including the first cover of The New Yorker, which is a, a real gem. But this is the man. That's Condé Montrose Nast. Um, he's not wearing, he, he was known for wearing his pince nez. He doesn't have these here. This is, but I, this is my favorite picture of him. I have it printed out and hanging in the wall of my office, and I always sort of in those moments of crisis and in, you know, look and say, all right, what would Condé do? And uh, Condé gets you through the day, so. <laughs> but today I wanna talk about, uh, about Condé Nast, who he was, and the empire that he built, and specifically what he did to support photographers and photography, um, with a capital P, and sort of set up the stage for someone like Mr. Penn and Mr. Lieberman to come in and collaborate and do the wonderful things that they did. So who was Condé? He was born in 1873 in New York City. At the age of two, his father took off to Europe to launch some business ventures, and his mother took him, Condé Nast, and his two sisters back to their hometown of St. Louis. He went to school at, in Georgetown. He went to the college here. Um, he delivered the bachelor oration at his 1894 graduation. He was a very good student. Uh, his roommate at Georgetown was a guy by the name of Robert Collier. Um, and I don't know if, if anyone that knows the history of magazines knows Collier's magazine uh, that was started by Robert's dad. So he had a little connection in the magazine business right from the get-go. 
Uh, he stayed on at Georgetown, got a master's degree, went back home to St. Louis, and studied the law at uh, Washington University, was trained as a lawyer. He had no interest in practicing law, never did it one day. Instead, he had that bug in his ear from Robert Collier, and he started working at a local printing company that was owned by some members of his family. Uh, it wasn't very successful. He came in, kind of strong arm his way, took the company over, and revived it. Now, Conde had kept in touch with Robert Collier. They were very close for many years. And when Collier heard of what he, the Conde had done with his little printing company, he said, well, we really could use some help here in New York with the weekly. And so, Con, you know, if you had the choice between uh, St. Louis and New York as a young man, what would you choose? So he uh, headed off to New York, and he started there as an advertising salesman making $12 a week. Like a fish to water, Nass took to the publishing business. He quickly climbed the ladder at Collier's, became the sales manager, then was the business manager by 1905. He completely turned the magazine around, the publishing side. He had a laser sharp focus on the bottom line. And they used to call him Figure Jim because he was obsessed with numbers and um, making sure that they were in the black. But he was also known as a creative thinker in terms of unique offerings. Uh, in those days, a magazine, you didn't call it an issue, it was a number. So while at Collier's, Nas came up with the idea of the special number or devoting an entire issue to a single topic or theme. Um, so now keep in mind that, um, oops, yeah. You know, Nas came from an upper middle class family, but in uh, 1902, while he was working at Collier's and he was, his career was flourishing and he was starting to make a lot of money, he met a woman through Robert Collier named Jean Clarissa Cordaire, and her, she was the daughter of one of the founding members of the famous Cordaire Brothers uh, law firm. And they eventually got married and with his wealth and her name, he landed on the social register, which was very important for the soon-to-be publisher of Vogue. Um, Robert Collier was his best man. They got married at St. Patrick's. And Nast was very successful, but he was getting a little bored at Collier's. Uh, he was making about $40,000 a year at this point, which is well over a million dollars uh, in today's money. but. He really had a, a drive and he wanted to have his own business, so he left Collier's in 1905 and he started negotiating with the Turnier family to buy Vogue. He always had his eye on it. He thought that it could be a lot more. It was just a weekly um, sort of society rag with 10,000 or so circulation. It wasn't that big. But he, he had a real feeling that it could be much more. He, and earlier, a couple of years before, he bought a, the Home Pattern Company uh, patterns were a very big business then. And he also, he and Robert Collier started a little publishing, a book publishing business on the side. So finally, in 1909, uh, there was a sudden death in the Turnier family, and they couldn't do it anymore. And they said, all right, we'll do it. We'll sell you Vogue. That's his first cover. is June 24th, 1909. So I want to think, think about modern media companies, right? Facebook was founded in 2004, Twitter came up 2006, Instagram in 2010. Conde Nast Publications was founded in 1909. Within 10 years, Nast had purchased Vogue, launched Vanity Fair, took an ownership stake in House and Garden, launched British Vogue, which happened during the war because the German kept sinking, uh, the German U-boats were sinking the ships and they couldn't get Vogue over in England, so they said, well, we'll start our own version over there. And it was the first time um, that an American publication had an international edition. Um, and then he also launched these other titles as well. So you, you think in terms of just rapid expansion for a new company. He immediately cut the what well, was a weekly back to fortnightly, raised the price of each issue from 10 to 15 cents, still $4 a year, which is considering $4 a year, now you can get it for 12. Um, by the summer of 1910, each issue was carrying nearly 100 pages of advertising. A year ago, it had been uh, 30, at a rate of $4 for every 10,000 readers. Now, competitors such as Ladies Home Journal, Women's Home Companion, they were charging $2 for 10,000 readers. And the circulation numbers at Ladies Home Journal, 1.3 million, Women's Home Companion, 700,000, Vogue, 30,000. 
Now that seems like a small number, but in that number is NAS strategy, which I'm going to get to in a minute. But in these early years, he had two key hires. The first was promoting a woman named Edna Woman Chase. She was a Quaker from New Jersey who, at, in 1895, at the age of 16, had got a sort of seasonal job stuffing Christmas cards into envelopes uh, through a friend. She was 16 years old. She never left. She stayed at Vogue until 1952. <laughs> it was the only job she had her entire life. She was an incredible woman. There's not a lot that's known about her. You talk about doing research. I mean, she would be a great story to tell. Um, and she took over in 1914, became the editor-in-chief. She was, at one point, was the editor-in-chief of American, British, and Paris Vogue simultaneously. She was tra traveling around the world, you know, by boat and by train through Europe. And, and she would go away for months at a time and sort of say, okay, here's your marching orders for the next three months and then move on to the next one. She was running all three. She, in, uh, during World War I, she came up with a concept of the modern runway show because uh, there wasn't much to report on when Europe was embroiled in, in war. So she went up to Mrs. Stuyvesant Fish's um, mansion up in Garrison along the Hudson and said, we've got to do something. We have nothing to report on. You know, the American fashion industry is dying. What if we have this big show? We'll get American designers. We'll walk their, their looks down a runway. And you bring all your society ladies. And Mrs. Fish said, you're crazy. No way. Is that ever going to happen? But as she was being led away, Mrs. Fish's maid said, stopped her and said, excuse me, excuse me, my son is an illustrator and he's trying to find work. Do you think you could get him an, an interview? And Mrs. J said, yes, absolutely. Please have him come in. <laughs> Do you think you could talk to Mrs. Fish again about this idea? And she said, oh, yes, 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 I'll work on her. Two days later, Mrs. Fish contacts her again. It's a go, right? So it was a big hit. Vogue reported on it for three issues. I mean, they dragged this thing out. But I mean, that's the kind of woman that Edna Chase was. The other key hire was a guy by the name of Frank Crowninshield, Crowney as he was called. And Crowney took over and he ran Vanity Fair. As Charlie mentioned, at first it was dress and Vanity Fair. That lasted about one issue. Crowney said, there's no way we're having a dress in the title of any publication that I'm doing. So they dropped the dress. He said, that's Vogue's job. Uh, and he just wanted to talk about arts, culture, society. And so they did. And that was Vanity Fair, which took off and running in, in 1914. And together, the three of them were lockstep, and they built that company up all through the teens and 20s. Now I want to get back to what I mentioned before about the strategy. In 1911, Nast sent his advertisers a letter. And it, it was a long letter, as they tended to be then. But one, there was one paragraph that I pulled out. As for progress in the periodical itself, there are many who say that Vogue and its unique influence over its readers and its editorial selection in the very intelligence and artistic quality of its makeup and in the superiority of its physical appearance dominates its field as does no other periodical. I mean, that's confident for you. But that was Nass's idea. He's like, we, our magazine has to be the best of everything. Now, two years later, his theory was solidified, and he put it down on paper. And this is a little pamphlet that was published in 1913 in a Baltimore trade journal. It was called Class Publications, and the essay completely laid out his approach to publishing. Now, class, you might, people think he means class like, uh, you know, the upper class. That's not true. It was a, it's what we call now niche publishing or something like that. So he describes it as thus. A class publication is nothing more or less than a publication that looks for its circulation only to those having in common certain characteristics marked enough to group them into a class. That common characteristic may be almost anything, religion, particular line of business, community of residence, common pursuits, or some common interest. When I say a class publication looks to one of these classes for circulation, I state it very mildly. As a matter of fact, the publisher, the editor, the advertising manager, the circulation man must conspire not only to get all of their readers from the one particular class to which the magazine is dedicated, but rigorously exclude all others. So this concept of class publications, what is now, as I said, called niche, lifestyle, special interest, whatever you want to call it, directly challenged the standard publishing principles of the day.
prior to NAS theories, the prevailing business model was centered on mass. It was all about mass market. The concept of limiting readership may seem counterintuitive, but NAS understood that limited readership was exactly what advertisers wanted. In his sales pitch, he would go to see an advertiser, and he would say to them, imagine if I dump a pile of pins on your desk, and in that pins are a hundred that have gold tips, and I can pull from my pocket and give you a magnet that you wave over the pile, and only the gold tip jump out and cling to the magnet. Vogue is that magnet. Vanity Fair is that magnet. And that was his sales pitch. He was the first publisher that really understood the power of aspiration. But even more importantly, he understood that it was the aspirants, those looking to enter a class or interest group, that are the most susceptible to advertising. Now, Vogue had mixed photography and illustration from the earliest days. However, the photography was commissioned through outside studios or done through pickups from stock suppliers. In 1910, NAS began crediting individual photographers their work in Vogue, which was a novelty. No one had really done that before. The move has a desired effect as photographers of prominence took notice. They said, well, this, this guy's actually really taking photography seriously. I mean, he's willing to put our names on these. And it was this photograph, published in the January 15th, 1913 number, that caused not only photographers, but readers as well, to sit up and really take notice. This is a portrait of Mrs. Harry Payne Whitney, the daughter of Cornelius Vanderbilt II, who was one of the original backers of Vogue when it launched in 1892. And it's considered by many to be the moment when society and the fashion world finally and completely merged. The dress, which is a Persian costume for a party of which she was the host, is really beside the point. It's her posture that's the true signifier. This is a woman of immense wealth and power, patron of the arts, an artist herself, who just recently, just before the photo was taken, had begun to stop using a pseudonym to sign her sculptures. She proudly stares directly into the camera, hand on her hip, nose in the air. In her pose, we see the breaking down of social structures and the beginning of the modern woman. The roots of 1920s liberation appear to have been planted in 1913. So this is by Baron de Meyer. And this photograph caused a sensation. Baron de Meyer, and these are all worked by him, was a European emigre, the Purple Marriage, and a questionable title. And he was an avowed pictorialist and really was the first celebrity photographer. Alfred Stieglitz, the patron saint of the photo successionist, had given de Meyer an exhibition at the 291 Gallery in 1912, and the chase had seen the show, had been taken with de Meyer's work, was even more impressed with his connections and title. That show led to the Whitney uh, photograph that you saw, and ultimately, with the help of uh, World War I, to his position as Condé Nast's first staff photographer. He had, was forced to leave Europe, and so he came to New York. De Meyer was given the princely sum of $100 a week. In exchange, he became exclusive to Vogue and the fledgling Vanity Fair. Now, according to Polly Devlin, De Meyer transformed fashion photography from being a sideline to a full-time artistic occupation and a fashionable way of life. Without De Meyer, there is no Mario Testino. De Meyer's studio photographs with their soft lenses, backlighting, and seemingly endless trace of lace and frills presented women of high social standing in an accessible manner. While ostensibly fashion pictures, the photographs were not truly about, about fashion. Don't forget, there really is no fashion industry to speak of in the US at the time, not at least a mass market. De Meyer's portraits were about these particular women and his, and by extension Vogue's, idea of luxury, beauty, and femininity. Now, De Meyer dominated the pages of Vogue and Vanity Fair for eight years, but in 1922, lured by a higher salary and the opportunity to live full-time back in his beloved Paris, De Meyer defected to Hearst in Harper's, Biz Harper's Bazaar. It would be the first such defection from Condé Nast to Hearst that plagued Condé Nast throughout his time that he owned the company. 
Demire's soft focus style was becoming a little unfashionable, so Nast and Chase didn't make too much of a fuss about letting him go. And however, the search for a new chief photographer was underway. In January 1923, Edward Steichen had come back to the U.S. after an unsuccessful attempt at a painting career in Europe. Recently divorced and kind of broke, Steichen was ready to jumpstart his photography career. Now, he lands in New York, he picks up the latest issue of Vanity Fair. Flipping through it, Steichen is shocked to see his own face looking back at him on page 54 above the caption, An Unrivaled Master. Now, the article mistakenly stated that Steichen, quote, the greatest of living portrait photographers, end quote, had given up the camera for the palette. In truth, Steichen had done exactly the opposite, so he wrote Frank Crowninshield to set the record straight. Crowninshield, who had been leading the search for DeMire's replacement, quickly arranged lunch at Delmonico's for the two of them and Condé Nast. Over stakes, Nast offered Steichen the position of chief photographer at Condé Nast, and while the offer was mainly to shoot portraits for Vanity Fair, Nast gently asked Steichen if he'd be willing to shoot the occasional fashion picture for Vogue. And to soften the perceived insult, Nast said the pictures could run uncredited if Steichen wanted. Now Steichen, who likes to take credit for inventing fashion photography with a spread that he had shot back in 1911, not only agreed to shoot the fashion, but said he would never allow a photo to be published that he would not be willing to sign. Nast was suitably impressed, and the deal was, was made. There's a few of Steichen's. I'm sure it's, everyone recognizes all those <laughs> works. Steichen's arrival at Condé Nast in 1923 kicked off the second major phase of photography in the company's history. De Meyer's soft-focused, idealized beauties quickly evolved into razor-sharp modern woman. As Nast told Steichen, every woman De Meyer photographs looks like a model you make every model look like a woman. Steichen, who had been shooting and painting for two decades, was most comfortable working with natural light and was the first Vogue photographer to routinely use it in his work. Charlie told that funny story about the, the lights, and it really is true. Steichen had no clue what to do when he walked in. He was completely panicked. And so that's, it, the curtain was mainly to sort of act as a deflector because he, he couldn't even imagine I mean, the, how to shoot with these lights. Now, while Steichen was commander in charge of, in, in the studio, and they did, they called him, um, they called him commander, <laughs> Nass stable of thoroughbreds was thoroughly stocked through most of the 20s and the first half of the 30s. Um, these are some more of Steichen's greats, um, including that. That's the first color cover that they did in 32. Charles Sheeler, modern look, complimented Steichen, while Baron George his crisp update to DeMire provided a contrast to what Steichen was doing. Cecil Beaton's fantastical tableaus and surrealist inspired designs filled the need for the British voice. And the German horse P. Horst, a Hune protege, arrived in the early 30s and provided a new pared down view with dominant classical elements and a masterful use of light and shadow. Horse contemporary John Rawlings went from being a set designer and studio assistant to stepping behind the camera. Throughout the 1920s, Nash remained focused on quality and prestige. His aim was to present his readers with the best of everything. The leading fashions, the smartest writers, the most talented artists, the newest talents and discoveries, and of course the top photographers that reasonable money could buy. He even went so far in 1925 as to buy a printing plant up in Greenwich, Connecticut, and he took over all aspects of their printing. And he ran that as a separate standalone business. They would print the NAS magazines during the day and then print outside clients at night and run it in the, the press ran as a profitable side business for him. Now Horst, who had a rocky start, but st ended up working at Vogue for more than six decades, summed up NAS commitment to his photographers and the medium. No other publisher has ever demonstrated a courage comparable to the late Condé Nast. This was after Nast had died. Photography owes him an incalculable debt. In the early days of Vogue and Vanity Fair, it was he who persuaded Baron de Meyer and Commander Edward Steichen literally to create fashion photography. Indeed, there is not one significant contemporary name in photography that has not appeared on the pages of Nast magazines. And until the day of his death, Mr. Nast remained creatively restless, 
always foreseeing inevitable change long before anyone else, always demanding and getting new results from old artists, always seeking out young talent and giving it rich and unpredictable opportunities. Horse said that in 1944. Now in 1934, Hune had a big dust up over his contract renewal with Dr. Aga. Uh, who we heard before, he was the reigning and powerful art director at that time over his contract. So he quit on the spot and went to where else? Harper's Bazaar. Two years later, the financial reality of the Great Depression forced Nass to close both Vanity Fair and the American Golfer, which is another title that he had. So this is 1936. 1937, due to the lack of portrait shootings uh, in the wake of Vanity Fair's clothing, clo closing, um, and also Steichen was just ready to move on. Um, he retired. In 1938, Cecil Beaton was embroiled in a very public scandal over some anti-Semitic text in a Vogue illustration that was called out in the press. He was forced to resign, and he crawled back to England in disgrace. So of Nass' original stars and his, his core group of talent from the 20s and 30s, only Horst and Rawlings remained. Now at the same time, art director Alexei Brodovich and the photographer Martin Mukazi's efforts at reinvig reinvigorating Harper's Bazaar were beginning to succeed. Under the guidance of editor Carmel Snow, herself trained at Condé Nast, went over to Hearst, Harper's became a serious rival to Vogue for the first time and was indeed the more risk-taking avant-garde of the two in the years leading up to the Second World War. Nast, meanwhile, still licking his wounds from the Depression years, became focused on launching a new magazine focused on Hollywood movie stars and their accompanying younger demographic. That magazine was Glamour, and it would prove to be Nass final venture. The outbreak of war in Europe, and this is the announcement from when they closed um, Vanity Fair. The outbreak of war in Europe sent American talent to the front and European talent to America. Lucien Vogel, who was the publisher of Vu, which we saw earlier, was a longtime friend and confidant of Nass. And he left Paris, he was forced out, and he came to New York, and so Nass just sort of gave him some projects to do. He acted almost as a consultant for the company. And among Vogel's charges was finding a new batch of photographic talent. So Vogel had sent Nast in the archive, we have all these memos that, Na that Vogel was sending to Nast all the time saying, well, I think this photographer really stinks and this one's too expensive and we tried him out and he was terrible, we should get rid of that one. And so they went back and forth and back and forth for years trying to find um, some, new, some new talent. One of those memos, which you can see the top here, doubled as a letter of introduction for his former art director at VU. Alexander Lieberman, you notice the spelling, it has not been um, Americanized yet. So Lieberman um, came, and you know the rest is history, as you've heard today, but it was that connection, um, and Lieberman actually, he was hired by Condé Nast, and under the um, opening that, that Vogel provided for him. And, and you know, the, the story goes that um, Nass came in, he was brought in, he brought in uh, Lieberman. Lieberman worked with uh, Dr. Aga for a week, came in on Monday, they worked. At the end of the week, Dr. Aga said, I'm sorry, this is not going to work out, but um, I'm going to have to let you go. And really it was because Dr. Aga knew. He saw the writing on the wall and he said, this is a young kid with talent and he's going to get my job. <laughs> so he said, but he said, no, nope, sorry, it's not going to work out. You don't have the skills. You're not right for Vogue you're gone. So uh, Alex, you know, went home, was really upset. And when he got home, there was a telegram from Nast, um, secretary, saying, don't forget you have an appointment with Mr. Nast on Monday. He wants to see how your first week went. So Alex went, okay. So he got up Monday morning, put on a suit, and he went to the office, and he went in to see, uh, to see Mr. Nast and said, how did it go? And he said, oh, it's been great. And we did this and we did that. And you know, I had this idea and he, he had won a, a design award when he was in Europe. So he brought that along too. And he's like, oh, did you see this? I won this when I was in France. And Nass was dutifully impressed and he gets on the phone and he says, bring me Aga. And Dr. Aga comes in and he says, I love this man. I think he belongs here. I want him on the staff. And Dr. Aga said, okay, Mr. Nass, you got it. And that was it. So, and he stayed on. Two years later, Aga was out. And, and, 
and Lieberman was running the show. So that was that is how the stage was set and for Penn to arrive. And I think it's really important to understand that photography is something that is ingrained into the culture at Condé Nast, and that started with the founder. It's still there today. And it's, you know, the image is always in the forefront at Condé Nast, and it's something that was not just, it didn't happen by accident, um, and that collaboration. And I think, you know, I always thought it was amazing that Lieberman was, you know, one of Condé Nast's sort of last acts was to hire Lieberman. And it really created and, and had that continuity. And then years later, when Mr. Newhouse, when Cy Newhouse took over the company, Lieberman really sort of took Cy under his wing in a way and, and worked with him and, and taught him. And so there is that real connection just through three men over 100 years and that real focus on, on the image and how important it is to the magazines and to the core of, of what they do. Now, a lot of the people that speak and we're speaking today obviously know a lot more about Penn and, and can speak much more about photography and, and, and all those kind of things. So I was trying to think, what is it that I can offer special? And one of the great things about Condé Nast, which I'm sure Charlie can tell you, is access. You know, And so you can sometimes be able to pick up the phone and call people that, and they might take your call or be willing to talk to you <laughs> just because of who you work for. And so I said, all right, who can I talk to? You know, who is, let's think what it meant to be on the other side, to have Mr. Penn be looking at you and taking your photograph. So I wanted to talk to an editor, and I wanted to talk to a fashion model, and I wanted to talk to a celebrity or someone who had their portrait taken. So. I started with uh, Nicole Kidman, right? Because she, at a very sort of early in her career in 1990, Penn photographed her. And it was an important photograph for her. It's a beautiful series, a black and white series. Um, and then he photographed her just a year later for when she did The Hours, which was also sort of her big breakout moment. And so we sort of exchanged and, and went back and forth. And one of the things, that she said was, Penn's brilliance was never intimidating. He was meticulous but gentle. With gentleness came trust, and with trust came a bearing of the soul. Trust was the key to finding the moment. And she's talking about this one particular moment that he photographed where she's sort of very revealed, and she's got her, a, a pinky in her mouth, and sort of head down, and she's very vulnerable. And, you know, Mr. Penn has this, you know, this sort of reputation in a way and of, of that people were intimidated by him. And, but everyone that I spoke to talked about how gentle he was and how his studio was like the safest place they had been and that it was dark and it was quiet and that he was clearly in control. But he created this environment where you were allowed to be free and relaxed in yourself. And that's the key and you see that in all the portraits. And you can look back from the very beginning, whether you're talking about the corners in, you know, in the 40s to portraits of designers that he did in the 2000s. But it's about you really understand and you see that person. And that is so much of what he created, that environment, and all the, the great photographers really can do that. Now, another person that I talked to was Marissa Berenson. And I said, they, you know, in, in the 60s, she came out, she started her modeling career, she was 16 years old in 1965. And he photographed her more than 200 times in, in five years. I mean, he, he, more than any other photographer, they worked together. And she always would, she said she asked Diana Vreeland, why do you put me with, with Mr. Penn? <laughs> you know, I mean, why not one of the young guys send me to Avedon studio where the music's going and everybody's dancing, you know? And Diana Vreeland said, no, 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 because that's, I need that. He is going to be able to protect you. And you're so different and opposite that it creates something interesting. And she felt that. And she said that, you know, I was a 16-year-old girl. And I was 
very, very shy and, you know, like any 16-year-old girl would be. And I had a lot of hiccups and, and holdups and, and insecurities. And she said, but it was just, you felt absolutely safe and totally in control and you could just give yourself over to him. And, you know, talking soft and this wonderful sense of humor. And he really would take the time and engage with the people that he was photographing. And that was, everyone that I spoke to, that's what they said, was, was the time and, and the work that he would put in. I mean, just that right there. That's one of the first things she said to me. And she talked about the lighting and how the lighting was set up and it, how it would take hours and hours to get the lighting just right. But she said, when it was done, you were lit in this complete way. And she, had, she said this wonderful thing. She said, you were in a cocoon of light when you were in his studio. It was almost as if you were in this room within the room that was just made up of white light. And it was absolutely luminous and perfect. And she said, you could see it in the work. It's like, she said, I don't even think they had to retouch anything. It was just perfect. It was absolutely perfect. And years later, she worked, of course, with Stanley Kubrick. And he, of course, was famous for setting up hours for lighting line. And he said, I thought, for her, working with, with Mr. Penn was practice for working with Kubrick and being on, on film sets. And Nicole Kidman also said the same thing to me. She said, you know, Irving Penn was the Stanley Kubrick of photography. And within 24 hours, I talked to both of them, and both of them said that. I was like, wow. I mean, both of, they both went right there with completely on their own and said how much, you know, the connection between him and, and Kubrick, which I thought was really interesting. Now, Marissa also did um, a nude with Penn. And it was her first nude that she had ever done. It was a two-page spread. It was in 1970. Um, she's wearing nothing but a necklace. She's sort of laying back and laughing. And she said, I couldn't have done that with anyone else. He was the only one I could have done that with. And she said, sitting, she remembers that so well. She said, sitting for that was like posing for a painting. It was like posing for Botticelli, you know. And, and afterwards, Avedon even sent a telegram and said, congratulations on that beautiful, on that beautiful picture. Um, she did say, though, that her grandmother was the fashion designer Elsa Scaparelli. And Scaparelli was mortified by that shoot. And actually never spoke to Diana Vreeland again after that. And, and, and uh, Marissa was living in Italy at the time and had to leave Italy. <laughs> she was drawn out. So it was, a little, it was a little risk for her. Now, the last person I spoke to was Phyllis Posnick, who was incredible. I mean, it's like, that's another one. There's another story that needs to be told. But she first met Penn as Bab Simpson's assistant. Um, but she later on, she stayed at Vogue, she worked up through the, through the ranks, and then after Anna came, Anna Winter, um, she connected the two of them. She thought that they could work together. And at the beginning, it was, it was uh, Phyllis and Alex and Anna, and they would sort of talk about the shoot, and Charlie, I'm sure you were in a few of those meetings too, and say, you know, this is the idea, this is what's happening, and then uh, Alex would draw, and then he would send a fax to Penn, and then Penn would sort of come back and say, okay, and then they would execute on it. But then after a little while, they must have had a conversation, and, and Alex one day called Phyllis in and said, you're on your own. Do it with Penn. And so after she, you know, swallowed hard and said, okay. So it went forward from there. So all the sittings were done, just the two of them. And she would go to the studio, and she would talk to him, and he would draw, and they would sort of say, what do you think? Yeah, that could work. And it was so much, and you know, all those great still lifes that a lot of people have talked about them today that Mr. Penn did at the end were done with Phyllis. And it's interesting that Alex was sort of out of the picture at that point. And in many ways, as people have alluded to, they were Penn's freest work, his sort of most perverse or subversive or whatever the word may be. And Phyllis was really, it was exciting for her because she saw him actually kind of loosening up, you know, as loose as Mr. Penn could be. It's still perfect and amazing, but he was taking a little bit of chance as he got a little older. And he sort of really reveled in it and, and really enjoyed it. And you see that. And a lot of that had to do with 
his collaboration with Phyllis, but also Anna being willing to say, all right, go ahead, push it, let's do this. You know, go ahead, see, see what you can come back with. So, and a lot of that too, there was a key moment for her in December 1995, there's a shoot called The Art of Couture. It was done in Paris, and she really wanted to do natural light. Penn was shooting a lot with strobes then. And so she asked him, you know, about those great pictures that he had done in, in the late 40s and 50s in Paris. And he said, oh, there was this wonderful studio, <laughs> you know, the daylight. And so Phyllis searched out, she couldn't find it, the building had been torn down. So she found a close approximation, and he was okay. And they went back and they shot natural light again. And it sort of came back into that practice. And so, and you can see it in the work. It gets, there's a sort of roundness to it that's not there. And some was still done with strobe, you know, I mean, the bee stung lip they did with strobe because the bee would move, you know, that kind of thing. But um, the chocolate mouth, that's a daylight shoot. And if you can see that in it. And so it really brought back the work again to what he was doing in the beginning with Alex in, the, in those early days. So, um, I think I just covered all that. So there's the other thing too. There's a lot of visual wordplay, and you know, turkey neck, the fat duck shoot, wearing a sack, bee stung lips, leather face, you know, with a football face, and and so there's this sort of this real intelligence and it, this nod to to literature and into words and also to um, to pop culture. It, it all pulls in. And you see all those things in there if you just sort of look below the surface. And Phyllis said this great thing to me. She said, he took, it, what he did was really obvious, but only after he did it. And I thought that that was really great. I mean, it's like, and the thing is too, once he did it, it can never be done again. I mean, who could ever do the beast on lips again? You can't. I mean, that, he, Mr. Penn owns that, you know. And so, um, that was just a little bit of the insights that I got, and I think um, that was all I had. Thanks. So for anybody thought the career of an archivist had to do with dust and cobwebs, just remember he's got Nicole Kidman on the speed dial. That was really terrific. Our last speaker of the afternoon, and after um, Andy does talk, um, we are all going to join uh, each other up here on stage and um, answer some of your questions. So please start thinking about those. Um, uh, Andy Grumberg is a writer, a curator, a teacher, an arts consultant. He's been a director of an institution called the um, Ansel Adams Center for Photography, the Friends of Photography in San Francisco, where for today's purposes, it might be important to note that he founded a magazine, the quarterly journal C, about um, photography and art. Among the major exhibitions he has organized are Photography and Art, Interaction Since 1946, Points of Entry, Tracing Cultures, Ansel Adams, The Nature Conservancy's Last Great Places, which was an extraordinary exhibit of commissioned landscape photography by um, a mix of kinds of photographers from fine arts, so-called photographers, to magazine photographers like Annie Leibovitz. He's perhaps best known to some of us of a certain age as the photography critic for the New York Times, a post he held for nearly 20 years through the 1980s when the term postmodernism was not as um, pejorative a term as it might be in some circles today. But he certainly charted, as he did for me and I think for many people here, the interactions between um, contemporary photography and the contemporary art world during that time. He currently holds the post of Professor of um, Photography and Art at George Washington's University Corcoran College of Art. Um, and so I'd welcome Andy Grunberg. Thank you much. 
Well, there's a certain advantage to going last, which is I get to stand up and stretch, and you're all having to sit there. Um, but other than that, um, it's difficult because if you're like me, you are so full of information, and I just wish I was sitting down with you processing what I've heard already. Um, for those of you that have been here all day, um, <laughs> half of what I'm going to um, be talking about you or and showing you, you've already seen, so this will be a kind of summary, and hopefully I don't um, make mistakes for people that know better than I do. Um, and then 50% of it is going to be about art criticism, so think of it as like a great way to get into cocktail hour. <laughs> I'm going to hope that if I press something that the uh, pictures suddenly appear. Oops. Not mine, but Sean's. All right, I think for the final time today, <laughs> the star of the day was going to have to appear again. Please give him a big round of applause. <laughs> it's like the Academy Awards. <laughs> oh yeah, we have to know who you are. Uh, I'm Max. <laughs> big hand for Max. All right. In any case, this is um, about as funny as this talk's going to get, right there. Um, so Nancy's already sh shown you this and talked a little bit about uh, the famous photographer's school with um, pen in the middle of the picture, but um, I just wanted to start with it as a way of um, framing what I'm going to talk about, which is the um, one-time separateness of what we think of as the photography world from the art world, and it's interesting that the famous photographer school was a um, followed on the heels of the famous artist school, and um, they're both great subjects for research. But the the famous artist school, the most famous artist that was part of that was Norman Rockwell, just to give you an idea. Um, so I think the photographers are a little more famous. In 1983, I attended a national conference in Philadelphia, the Society for Photographic Education, at what we might now consider the peak moment or high watermark of enthusiasm for the kind of art known as postmodernist, which I now know is, has a pejorative con connotation today. Um, I'm in trouble already. <laughs> Rosalind Krauss, one of postmodernism's most influential and creative critics, was the conference's keynote speaker invited because, at least in my mind, she could bring the assembled teachers of photography the news that photographs were taking the art world by storm, although not according to terms that Beaumont Newhall and John Sharkowski would have ever imagined. Think, for example, of Richard Prince's re-photographs of Marlboro cigarette advertisements, an appropriation of commercial photography at its most innocuous. Krause's talk, which was later published in October magazine, under the title, A Note on Photography and the Simulacral, began by discussing a French newspaper feature called Minute pour une image, in which a famous French author would comment on a famous image by a French photographer. Then she introduced the audience to the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, who, besides none of us had ever heard of him, in his book Un Art Moyen, argued that since photography is understood as a representation of the real, it can have no aesthetic basis of its own. Finally, as the Philadelphia audience's attention was beginning to wander, Krauss turned her attention to discussing two contemporary American photographers. Cindy Sherman, who was the leading standard bearer for postmodernism, criti postmodernist criticism, would have counted as expectable, and Irving Penn, who was not. Krauss's focus on Penn in that talk and her attention to his work even earlier puzzled me at the time and continues to be a subject of fascination for me. Of all the photographers then representing their work in art galleries and museums, why pick Penn as a model of modernism to juxtapose with Sherman, the model of postmodernism? 
Why not William Eggleston or Lee Friedlander or Robert Adams or even Ansel Adams, for goodness sake? That's examples of photographers presenting their work within the aesthetic discipline of contemporary photographic practice, which is to say firmly within the precincts of John Sharkovsky's formalist conception of the medium as what he called a different kind of art. Penn, of course, was at this time enjoying a flood of art world attention and curatorial validation in the form of exhibitions of his platinum palladium prints, which he had taught himself to make in the 1960s. And this, in turn, had led to a renaissance of his reputation and arguably his status within the wider world in which he had long labored, the world of magazine photography, which encompassed fashion, celebrity portraiture, and commercial advertising. It was, I think, precisely Penn's background in the commercial world of photography that fascinated Krauss, as well as his turn to making art of material that was the precise opposite of what his commercial work represented. Instead of fine fabrics cut into elegant shapes by designers and worn by flawlessly beautiful young women, he made pictures in platinum of discarded cigarette butts, flattened deli food containers, and mashed coffee cups, as well as of metal blocks and skulls. This apparent 180 degree turn from the youthful perfection of his fashion pictures, he then complicated by reprinting his fashion classics in platinum and exhibiting them as works of art as well. The sense of complication of lines being blurred between the high art of 20th century avant-garde modernism and the less high arts of magazine, fashion, and marketing made Penn perhaps less exemplary of modernism than Krauss made him out to be in her talk, but ultimately more interesting as an artist for her and eventually also for me and for many others. It thus pays us to go back and examine more closely what Krauss and others saw in Penn and to examine his career as an instruct instructive instance of an artist who at once violates and exceeds the aesthetic standards by which her or his work is received. I want to spend the bulk of this talk then unpacking the public and critical reception of Penn's photography as an art, but also to examining the currency of Penn's work today, especially in terms of contemporary lens-based art. It would be easy to argue that Penn, along with Richard Avedon and other masters of fashion photography in the second half of the 20th century, has been passed by in an age when di digital imagery and media fragmentation conspire to condense our attention spans and limit our ability to enjoy remarkable single pictures. Indeed, anyone who looks at Vogue today or Harper's Bazaar or L or W will find precious little direct evidence of Penn's stilled, elegant, high style. But I want to claim that Penn's enduring influence is not a matter of style, but of how his work made fluid conventional distinctions between art and fashion, art and commerce, and perhaps most important for some of us, art and photography. You may have seen this before too. For at least the first half of his career, Penn saw himself primarily as a magazine photographer, swimming as he was in a world in which all the money and fame points were to be won by competing for space on the printed page of daily, bi-weekly, or monthly publications. He was in Alexander Lieberman's, he was as Alexander Lieberman, his art director at Vogue would remark in 1960, the complete graphic artist with the qualifier graphic taking most of the afflatus out of the artist balloon. At the same time, however, from as early as his years as a student, Penn had har harbored an ambition to be an artist without any qualifiers. Having learned the graphic design profession under the tutelage of Alexei Brodovich, the art director of Harper's Bazaar starting in 1934 and Penn's teacher in Philadelphia, he became familiar with avant-garde artists from Europe who helped pay their grocery bills by taking on assignments for Bazaar. Brodovich, an emigre himself who came to the United States in 1930 via his native Russia and Paris, favored surrealism especially, giving work to artists like Man Ray and Salvador Dali and urging the American photographers he worked with to venture into similar uncharted experimental territory. This is um, a cover of 
Harper's Bazaar from 1938, um, and it's by the poster artist that Charlie introduced you to, A.M. Cassandra. Um, this is a page from Harper's Bazaar of a Man Ray photograph that Man Ray conspired to photograph his own painting as part of it. Um, and this is an article all about Salvador Dali. Um, Penn was not a photographer when he was under Brodovich's spell, although he bought a camera in his final year as a student. And as the exhibition at this museum shows, took some remarkable pictures of storefronts and signs starting in 1938. He had other ambitions, however. In 1941, he quit his job at Saks Fifth Avenue, which Brodovich had essentially handed him to travel to Mexico to paint. As Mary Foresta explains in her catalog essay, whatever paintings Penn might have produced on this trip did not survive Penn's critical scrutiny, but pictures that he took with his Roloflex camera he brought along and used on a train trip south do. They show a debt to Eugene Atjes and Walker Evans's seemingly forensic approach to documentary style and to Evans's fascination with the vernacular. Even though Penn had no memory of seeing Evans' classic American photographs, in either book or exhibition form when it first appeared. Just to go back to these pictures, this is a, this is a uh, street photograph Penn made in New York before his trip to Mexico th through the South. This is a picture that he took during that trip or on the way to Mexico. These are all in the exhibition. And this is a street picture that he took when he got back from Mexico they all seem fairly coherent or consonant with each other. Once in the Condé Nast fold, originally as a designer and then as a full-time photographer, Penn was content to let his reputation rest on the pictures he produced for its magazines, including House and Garden and Town and Country, as well as Vogue. This was not a bad decision, since in the 1940s and 1950s, there was little to no market for exhibiting or selling photographs. Even books of photographs by one practitioner, like American Photographs, were rare compared to the photo book onslaught we see today. Photographic prints were not editioned or called vintage or even valued. Often magazines would toss them after a printing plate had been made. As Penn said in the 1950 article, the end product of a magazine photographer's effort is the printed page, not the photographic print. This didn't stop Penn from occasionally venturing off the Vogue reservation to produce work that he felt he needed to do for his own reasons. The series of nudes of artist models done in 1949 and 1950, known as Earthly Bodies, are an example to which I'll return later, as are the portraits he made in 1948 in another photographer's studio in Cuzco, Peru. Lieberman was savvy enough to encourage Penn to continue his ethnographic interest, publishing subsequent series of exotic others in vogue, but Lieberman apparently advised Penn not to let the nudes be seen in public. Penn's first attempt to bring his photographs together as images to be assessed as works of art was in late 1960 when Simon & Schuster published Moments Preserved, Eight Essays in Photographs and Words, and the Alexandre Eolis Gallery in Manhattan exhibited prints of images from the book in a one-person show called Photographs by Irving Penn. Let me apologize now for the fact that I took these slides myself. Um, this is a, this is a uh, spread from Moments Preserved um, chosen at random. <laughs> Unlike more radical attempts to cast photography as an art via the book form, such as William Klein's New York and Robert Frank's The Americans, both published a few years earlier, Moments Preserved includes captions and introductory texts, which show an affinity to Vogue magazine's approach to presenting cultural information as something in need of explanation. The book begins with an introduction written by Penn's mentor, and Vogue's design eminence, Alexander Lieberman. In his introduction, Lieberman takes pains to stake, claim, to, takes pains to stake Penn's claim to art status, which predictably means that he must first ratify the claim that photographers can be artists 
and f photographs can be art. He starts, therefore, rather generically. Lieberman, a collection of one photographer's work is an unquestionable record not only of the exterior world, but of his sensitivity and inner reaction to that world. His collected photographs are truly the reflection of his mind's eye. It is this reflection or second image superimposed on every photograph that gives his photograph that gives his photography its richness and this second image that gives us a composite picture of the man's creative soul is revealed fully only in an accumulation of pictures by the same artist. So I wanted to show you that the, the highlight of the book is less this, the the color pictures, which include some kind of blurry um, pictures that look like Brodovich should have taken them. Um, some early attempts at color photography, which we have to remember was color was a difficult medium, um, even in the 1940s. And then these black and white pictures of the small tradesmen that he took in Paris, London, and New York, which are found in the back of the book. There's 101 of these pictures beautifully laid out in a grid. But again, like a magazine, they don't want to stay with the same format for too long. In any case, Lieberman isn't content to just leave it at that. He goes on to define what he means by artist. And here we, quote, and here we have come to the important word, artist. To be an artist is to see purely, to seek everywhere and by every means revelations in life. Inspired and possessed, the true artist lets instincts seek out correspondences between his inner yearnings and the outward reality. Lieberman then gets to Penn. Irving Penn is a photographer who is one of the great new artists of light. He was one of the first to challenge the acceptance of documentary news photography as an art. In the best of his photographs, he has succeeded in imposing his ideal on matter-of-fact reality, an ideal of beauty that has made a whole generation of artists and photographers pause, admire, and imitate his work. For above all, a pen photograph is a beautiful image. Here and throughout the rest of his introduction, Lieberman seems to be casting for rationales that will explain why Penn, as a photographer, qualifies an, as an artist. One can scarcely imagine what he might have meant in claiming that Penn challenged documentary news photography as an art, since few photographers at the time, much less art critics, thought about news photography as art. Perhaps Lieberman meant that Penn's studio practice stood in opposition to the candid Flaneur methods of photographers like Cartier-Bresson and Kappa, or even Frank. But this seems a bit of a reach. No matter, the art director goes on to cite Penn for reinvigorating what he calls the classical vision, for being a pioneer in the use of color, for having a camera that does not lie. This is a much later picture that is not in um, moments, moments preserved. While seeming to grasp at straws, Lieberman does get to something essential about Penn's unique accomplishment when he quotes Charles Baudelaire as saying, that which is not slightly distorted lacks sensible appeal, from which it follows that irregularity, that is to say the unexpected surprise and astonishment, are an essential part and characteristic of beauty. That an unexpected surprise is essential to beauty seems to be something Penn took totally to heart not only in his fashion and portraiture, but obviously, but also, and perhaps most obviously, in his long fascination with cigarette butts, coffee containers, and chewing gum deposited unceremoniously on sidewalks. It was also an idea he would have been encouraged to cultivate by his design teacher and first mentor, Bradovich, whose lifelong refrain to his students was the French étonnez-moi, astonish me. Ultimately, though, one can construe Lieberman's argument for photography's function as art as essentially a modernist one, since it asserts the primacy of individual vision and the fundamental virtue of discernment, fundamental virtue of discernment as the essentials of photographic art. 
Now we get to my favorite newspaper. Jacob Deshin, the longtime photography columnist for the New York Times, gave mention to the publication of Moments Preserved and of Penn's accompanying show at the Eolus Gallery in the paper's December 4th, 1960 edition. I say gave mention to because photography criticism at the time was, in the contemporary sense, rudimentary. But judge for yourself, here is the full text of Deshin's remarks on Penn. Mr. Penn has the unusual distinction of being appreciated both by painters and photographers. The latter will be particularly impressed by his high sense of craft as it is demonstrated in the original prints in the gallery and the bold use of the medium that has sent him set him apart as one of the most inventive and imaginative photographers of our time. Painters find his free use of lighting, pose, and his choice of material find in his free use of lighting pose and his choice of material the feeling of an artist. The layman is impressed by the sheer impact and novelty of Mr. Penn's compelling Im imagery. The ex exhibit should be seen by all three, artist, photographer, and layman. The book is one of the most important in photographic literature and belongs in the library of every serious photographer. Close quote. Deshin does not mention whether the prints in the show were in black and white, color, or a combination of both, but for many it was Penn's use of color, as Lieberman noted in the book, that was the most distinguishable aspect of his artistry. In 1950, he had been part of a Museum of Modern Art exhibition color photography during the Edward Steichen era, and was one of the contributors to Lieberman's 1951 book, which I think we haven't mentioned today, called The Art and Technique of Color Photography, which featured the work of 17 photographers who worked for Condé Nast Publications. Deshin devoted the rest of this column to another book and show, Hummingbirds, featuring bird photographs by Crawford H. Greenewalt, whom Deshin notes had a day job as the president of the DuPont Company. Sadly, Mr. Greenewalt's project has failed to find its way even into the footnotes of contemporary photography history. Today, for us, it may be hard to appreciate what the Times writer meant when he cited Penn's, quote, free use of lighting, pose, and choice of material, or even to know if choice of material refers to Penn's gel silver gel prints or the range of subject matter of his pictures. But the idea that these combine to produce what Deshin calls the feeling of the artist gives us some idea of what photography was up against at the time. To be taken seriously as art, most writers then felt, photographs needed to produce aesthetic effects similar to those created by painting, drawing, and sculpture, so that they adopted the modernist pre-war discourse of, form of formalism almost by default. I do not mean this in any way to impugn the reputation and achievement of Jack Deshin, who was a tireless crusader for photography's status as an art even into his 80s, and who, and who generously supported my early critical efforts. I only mean to point out that in terms of sophistication and compared to contemporary art criticism, the criticism of photography was separate but not equal. This mirrored a situation through art, throughout the art world of the time, Photographs, with few exceptions, like Penn's show at Eolus, were not, were not part of the purview of art galleries, art collectors, art critics, and most museum curators. The only places where photography could be seen on exhibition were in bars and coffee shops, like Helen G.'s legendary Limelight, a Greenwich Village coffee house come gallery. And of course, at the Museum of Modern Art, which had established a, a photography department in the late 1930s. Penn's pictures appeared in group exhibitions throughout the 50s and into the 60s, most prominently in Steichen's landmark, landmark show, The Family of Man, in 1955, and in two traveling shows called Photography in the Fine Arts that traveled throughout the country in 59 and 60, and also in John Tcharkovsky's The Photographer's Eye, in 1964, one of the earliest shows produced by the influential Museum of Modern Art curator. The Museum of Modern Art even has a record of an exhibition in 1961 devoted entirely to Penn, titled Photographs by Irving Penn. But according to the Penn archives at the Chicago Art Institute, 
The show never appeared at the museum in New York. Instead, it traveled to Philadelphia and other venues, including, significantly for this occasion, to the Arts and Industry Building of the Smithsonian in the summer of 1963. Curiously, but perhaps telling me, my searches into databases of art journals have turned up virt virtually nothing in terms of critical responses to these shows, the family of man being the obvious exception. To find art critics writing coherently and incisively about photographs in general, and Penn's photographs in particular, we need to skip ahead to the late 1970s and early 1980s, when the, when the art tide shifted and photography acquired its own network of galleries, collectors, and critics, when museums across the country began to actively collect and exhibit photographs, and when photography became a subject taught within college and university art departments. In short, when photography, for reasons still being unpacked, became widely accepted as an art. So let me turn the clock ahead to those years, starting with a long review written by one of the most widely followed critics of the day, Hilton Kramer, that shows how much the conversation has changed. In a piece called Notes on Irving Penn in the October 29, 1977 issue of The Nation, Kramer does not argue for or against photography's status as an art. Instead, he argues about fashion photography's art status which as followers of Kramer's career might have reason to anticipate, he finds extremely problematic. Speaking of fashion photographers generally, presumably to include Richard Avedon as well as Penn in his distaste for fashion, Kramer told his re readers, quote, their uncanny art, their, their canny artifice is now embraced as genuine art and their worldly predilections forgiven perhaps even admired as a necessary strategy. Kramer was responding specifically to a trio of major exhibitions of Penn's remarkably large, for the time, platinum prints, cigarette butts at the Museum of Modern Art in 1975, so-called street material, of which this is an example, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 1977, and a more general sampling of pictures shown at the Marlboro Gallery in the same year, shortly before Kramer's review appeared. While most of the review reads as resolutely negative, Kramer's conclusion does manage to make the work sound important. Quoting, everything else in his work as we can now see was a preparation and a rehearsal for his flight into the abstraction of the gutter. Fashion photography is itself, of course, a mode of ab abstraction that removes the beautiful from all contact with reality, but it is an unsatisfactory mode of abstraction since it is obliged to wear the disguises of reality. This, the dishonored cigarette butt, is no longer obliged to do. Discarded on the street, it makes its exit from the world of observation and becomes at that moment the perfect dane for an art that aspires to be purely itself. Kramer, at the time he wrote this, was the art editor of the Times and soon beco to become the chief art critic of the paper, so his attention, no matter how skeptical, was a boon to Penn's reputation as an artist. That this happened to coincide with a fallow period in Penn's work for Condé Nast is significant, as the art market was beginning to provide an alternative source of income for many photographers. It also coincided with a period in which magazines, and in particular mass audience picture magazines, such as Life, Look, Collier's, and the Saturday Evening Post, succumbed to the pressures of television advertising, thereby vastly reducing the number of photographs seeing their way into the printed page. Fast forward three years to 1980, and the Marlboro Gallery begins brings to light a hidden episode in Penn's career, a series of gelatin silver prints of apparently overweight female nudes, as I mentioned earlier, done by Penn in 49 and 50, and titled Earthly Bodies. The gallery published a catalog for the show and enlisted Rosalind Krauss to write the essay. Krauss, an art critic and art historian and one of the founders of the critical journal October, began her career as a faithful Greenbergian modernist but transformed to become one of the most powerful and convincing aesthetic advocates of postmodernism. 
In Penn, she found a photographer who sh whom she could analyze as if he were a painter, but whose use of the camera and photographic materials made him ex cathedra in Greenbergian terms. Krauss began by noting that the nudes represent for Penn a turn from the culture of style of his fashion work to the culture of culture, and compared the images to paintings by Picasso and Matisse and sculpture by Brancusi and Henry Moore. In this, she was following a re regimen utterly conventional for art historians then and even now. But she then addresses the issue raised by photography that are distinct to the medium and make it, in Tcharkovsky's phrase, a different kind of art. Among the open questions that Krauss suggests constitute the photographic discourse are these. What constitutes quality in a photograph? How can one tell a good one from a bad or even mediocre one? Is a, photography's is a photograph's quality in, in relation to its acknowledgement of the nature of the photographic medium, or is it to be found as the more exclusive property of its subject? These are, I might note, questions that continue to haunt the medium. Krauss then locates what she sees as a theme underlying all these questions, the relationship of photography to the real, or, as she says, for the photographers who have for the photographers who have emer emerged in the last two decades, photography is not so much about the real as it is of the real. This contemporary fascination with the real is what distinguishes Penn's nude, she says, since their intense formal beauty seems designed precisely to supersede it. Quoting Krauss, it is from the perspective of this progressive move away from photographic formalism and particularly any formal vision that is openly in debt to the aesthetic conventions of the other arts, that these works by pen might appear photographically apostate. For at this point, photography wishes to be selectively promiscuous. Any form of the real may be embraced except art, because it is art that is seen as a threat to photography, as something that will denature it. In short, here Krauss sees pen as an exceptional artist of the camera because he is unthreatened by precedents in art, by pictures that do not stem from photography's own traditions or medium-specific characteristics. So one has to ask, is this not analogous to architects who violated the form follows function constraints of modern architecture in order to reintroduce elements of decoration and historical reference? I'm of course thinking of Michael Grave and uh, great Michael Graves and others of a generation we know as postmodernist architects, or to dancers who forsook, forsook the pared down essentialism of modern dance to reintroduce theatricality and narrative. I'm suggesting that for Krauss, Penn's transgressions of the medium, the medium's prohibition against referencing art was as signal and significant as his transgressions of the bounds of fashion photography. And more important, it was a transgression of how the modern art of photography had been constituted. Finally, lest I leave us all in the weeds, let me end with the Krauss article with which I began this talk, Photography in the Simulacral. And the first question we might ask is, what is the simulacral? Essentially, it means that because all the images we encounter via photography, television, movies, advertising, and the like, which shape our lives almost invisibly, we now live in a substitute world, an image world, rather than the world as it really exists. As Krauss puts it, paraphrasing the French theorist Jean Baudrillard, we are surrounded, it is argued, not by reality, but by the reality effect. The product, the product of simulations and signs. Which takes us back to Penn's earliest photographs. Penn played a large role in the 20th century as a producer of such signs in fashion, advertising, celebrity portraiture, and ethnography. But I believe Krauss sees him as, a, as distinct in part because he did this with a sense of self-awareness or what we call critical distance. In his late still lifes in Platinum, which the article discusses at length, Krauss asserts that, quote, the domain of high art is self-consciously evoked. She sees this as occurring across the putative photographic, 
She sees this as occurring across the putative photographic divide between art and commerce. This is one of the pictures she used in that talk. Quoting Krauss, the work Penn has done for Clinique Cosmetics, which month after month has filled facing pages in Vogue, Harper's Bazaar, and Town and & Country with elegant, shallow, luminous still lifes of bottles and jars, creating a kind of centerfold of cosmetic promise, is the visual twin of its conceptual counterpart, the platinum work that speaks not of per perpetual youth, but of death. And she continues, Penn has turned to art undoubtedly as a means of escaping the world of commercial photography. This has happened at the same moment the art world has turned to commercial photography as, this, as the description of the very limits of vision. What Krauss means here by the very limits of vision, I'm not entirely sure, but we do know that for many postmodernist artists of the 1980s, commercial photography represented a fresh domain of material for making art, a territory rich in possibility and without aesthetic pretensions that had once, in an earlier criti critical regime, been off limits. As I mentioned when I started, the other artist who figures large in Krauss's essay is Cindy Sherman, whose untitled film stills seemed to many at the time to change the terms by which photography was understood. Sherman herself understood photography as the other of art, Krauss says, adding that her use of photography does not construct an object for art criticism, but constitutes an act of such criticism. While Sherman's work may not look especially commercial, its sources are not in the pages of art history books or photo history books, but in films and television, and as the series title suggests, still photographs taken to publicize these. So while Sherman appears in each of the images, it is not Sherman as an autonomous author that we see, but rather an amalgam of models derived from lens-based media and embodied by her. Yet as distinct as Sherman's work is from Penn, from Penn's, the criticism surrounding her work and that of other postmodernist artists like Richard Prince, Barbara Kruger, and Sherry Levine helped finally demolish the boundaries between high art and commerce that Hilton Kramer and Clement Greenberg before him had insisted upon. In this sense, Sherman and Penn are not polar opposites of a modernist, postmodernist sort, but participants in an opening up of the definition of the art of photography during a per particular period of the medium's history. Always like to end with the cover of the catalog. We now know that Krauss was wrong when she said that Penn turned to art to escape commercial photography. In fact, and I'm echoing Sean and other speakers here, many of the most remarkable pictures of his life as a fashion photographer were taken in the last two decades of his life, as can be seen in the exhibition. In them, we can see a return to the fascination with surrealism that marked the very beginnings of his career, as well as a feeling of morbidity that, su that suggests he was considering his own death as a subject for his photography. The perfect world of beauty lies in tatters. Penn then remains influential today, not because photographers imitate his style of composition or printing, which I would say is the most superficial form of influence, but because his work is a hinge connecting modernism to postmodernism. Its formal qualities, originality, and obvious marks of authorship mark it as modern, but its inextricable blurring of the boundaries between art and its other, fashion, commerce, Krauss calls the culture of style, and Clement Greenberg called kitsch, rooted firmly in the world of art as we know it today. Thank you. <laughs>